If you enjoy our original content, please consider becoming a supporter on Anchor so that we can continue to bring you laughs every week. The following program may contain immature situations, themes, and is intended for an adult audience. The opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of everyone else working on the show. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome, guys, Welcome. to the Danny McDermott Show. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are live from John Lennon's old mansion right now, which I am uh, I'm showing off with a drink and a dramatic move. Okay. How's it going, Kevin? <laughs> Not too bad. If I would have known, Danny, I would have had a cognac. <laughs> oh, come on, Kevin. You're always having a cognac. I actually don't drink, Danny. I have two additions, and damn it, I need them both. So you're just messed up because of nothing? <laughs> I am. It's the truth. You know what's right. funny? Like I get a surprising amount of of like emails regarding bourbon and I don't even drink. And <laughs> in this day and age of targeted advertising, it's such a disaster that I actually might have to consider drinking bourbon. You know, you look like a bourbon drinker. You really do. Not it's a cognac drinker? It's probably face recognition. <laughs> <laughs> So it's uh, Donald Duck Day. So uh, I, I wore a duck bill, a blue shirt with a red bow tie and no pants out to th this morning to the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really pleased with the attention that came my way. You know, it's it looks like a fetish. Either way, I'm, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, International Archives Day, which I like to call Virtual Hoarding Day. Uh, it's hoarding without all the newspapers, garbage, and jars of pee, which hoarders justify by calling them kindling rations and jars of fire dousers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's National Earl, what is it, Earl Balta's Day? Yes. Which, yeah, it's also called National Earl Day, but the day started in honor of Earl Balta's, who was involved in racing after he left band leading behind. Which it's a natural progression, you know. Uh, <laughs> calling it Na National Earl Day is an issue in parts of the South Dakota, of course, who want to clarify if, if that's motor Earl or heating Earl. I think if your name is Earl, you should have to own a tractor. This, I mean, the rule is already at 60% compliance. <laughs> <laughs> Toy Industry Day. I feel like our show would probably prefer this to be Sex Toy Industry Day. What do you think, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> I love it how you pause before you laugh on every joke. I think the pantsless <laughs> visit to, to the supermarket is probably <laughs> Sex Toy Day at, at, at the market for somebody. Isn't everything a sex toy if you're brave enough? Really? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a Wolverine or a honey badger is a sex toy, no matter how brave you are. And I depending think on how far along in his heating Earl probably isn't either. <laughs> it's also national strawberry rhubarb pie day. Uh, if, if you think wearing a Donald duck costume in public is embarrassing, try doing it with a rhubarb pie. <laughs> <laughs> like that makes a difference. <laughs> All right, so I am very excited about today's show. Um, we've got two guests that are just brilliant, brilliant human beings. I met uh, Zach at a at uh, Deepak's birthday party, as a matter of fact, and uh, 
I just sat there in awe of his brain while he was speaking about Bitcoin. It was incredible. So let's I, let's bring him on because we can do. I want to do the segments while while uh, while they're on. Uh, so he, this guy is a writer, a business developer, and entrepreneur with a passion for transmuting imagination into reality. And it's it, he can almost do it magically right in front of your eyes. He serves as a founder and CEO of the business development company. Uh, order of Merchants and production slash entertainment company Starscript Incorporated. Please welcome Zach James, ladies and gentlemen. What's up, Danny and Kevin? What's welcome. up, buddy? Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show, man. Dude, it was funny because I, when I met you at the party, right? When I normally when I meet people, I'm like, hey, how's it going? Good. What's going on with you? Uh, you know, what's go just small talk. You like schooled me on within seconds. You, you just, you're, it was like an encyclopedia wealth of material on, on, on currency and on how it, how it, um, you know, money was from uh, aquatic terms and all that kind of stuff and thermodynamics and all this kind of stuff. And I was just blown away and I had to have you on the show. I knew it that second. So why don't you tell, tell our audience a little, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I am a writer and storyteller at heart. I'm a lover of language and that love of language uh, crosses over into storytelling, both uh, fictional and non-fictional in the non-fictional world. I'm a business plan writer and designer. I built websites, and really both business plans and websites and business development in general is storytelling. You know, and I know we, talk about storytelling a lot when we go into the marketing world, but really your business plan is your story of your business. And we kind of have to get it out on paper first before it starts manifesting, or at least it's a way to start transmuting, taking it from an idea, which is kind of like the air sign into reality, which is more like the earth sign and like paper, you know, talking about it for sure. There's all these ways and going in that direction. So I've got that, um, um, in the nonfiction space, also I've done a lot of reading in, in the legal world with legal research and financial research and banking. Uh, and then I have the fictional side uh, where I'm just a sci-fi fantasy geek and I'm into you know deep spiritual philosophy, where did we come from, ancient civilizations, um, you know, what is this experience being in a body? Why do we go to sleep every night and not realize what's going on, even though it's our own body? So I definitely go into both of those. Uh, fields and just feel like kind of in our whole mind, every thought we have, it's just contributing to an ever evolving story. It's amazing. Now, uh, I just want to check something with, with Susanna. Uh, someone commented, no sound. Are people hearing the show? I'm hearing just fine. Okay. I can't hear you now. That is on, but she's she's on mute. <laughs> I, I think Sandra needs to check her speakers. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Battery and hearing aid. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, so uh, when I when I bumped into you, you started talking about something that everybody's talking about right now, and nobody understands it like you do. Can you please tell us a little bit about cryptocurrency? Yeah, so I'm definitely a beginner and explorer, also. And anytime the subject comes up, I'm like, you know, I'm coming through it. I'm coming at it from a discovery standpoint, but. Um, uh, obviously, there's some base elements that make the first blockchain, uh, which is Bitcoin. Uh, and one is that it's a um, it's an immutable ledger or an immutable database, which means that when data gets uh, written to it, then you can only read it from that point forward. And I always like to compare that to you know things that are already going on. In fact, historically, when explaining financial concepts, I like talking about you know something that everybody can relate to and maybe at least some people can relate to this and that is we do have public records that exist right now that is a people we, we could all go search and find information there's court cases there's the secretary of state there's the county recorder's office and all of these are really intended to be immutable ledgers like bitcoin now can somebody who works there go inside and manipulate it i'm not really sure you know about the inner workings of that with bitcoin the answer is no uh, and that's something that is auditable that we can all see. So that's what's kind of uh, one of the base elements is that it's an immutable ledger that once you write to it, you can only read. Now, it doesn't mean you can't change the conditions 
of what happened in that re in that first record, but you have to make a new record to reflect that. So just like if you were to uh, you know transfer title of a property to me in exchange for money that I gave you, and you spelled my name wrong, and like oh what ha what the heck, Danny spelled my name wrong. You're like oh let me go tell the county recorder's office. You'd have to make a new filing on top of the old one because right. that first one is always there in the record. It's kind of like reality, right? Like like all thoughts we think and and um, you know everything we do it like it basically we're a sum of of our history in a way you know right. the world is a sum of everything that came before it so that's one of the main elements also that the immutable ledger is something that is auditable at least if you're dealing with public blockchains it's something that anybody could look at and view the history they may not know who the account holder is but they could view the history and another element is that it's decentralized which means there's no uh, central database that you can go to that's based in one state or another state or in another country that could you know, go down due to a power failure or a government raid or um, you know, theft or anything like that so because, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So you're saying it's basically, you, you know, if you invest in it, it's always gonna be there. There's nothing that can- That's the, I, I mean, that's the idea. It's like hard to guarantee anything, but that seems to be the record so far is that, um, yes, that you basically, when you have one of these coins, there's a record of you having them on the blockchain and you're using your, you know, your private key and your public key sort of as an address to, to access that. And the whole private key, public key world, you know, has existed since before crypto. So there's a lot of things that have already existed before cryptocurrency that kind of but got put together to make it. And then from that, it came like an explosion of different use cases, which is where all these other cryptocurrencies and stuff arise from that really it's not just Bitcoin. And if you're just hearing about Bitcoin, just recognize that it's a much bigger world than that. And Bitcoin is actually far, very limited, even though it has a ton of applicability, it's very limited compared to a lot of the other coins that are out there. And 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 with the new, a lot of new projects coming out, a lot of uh, people believe that, you know, Bitcoin's blockchain tech is, you know, can, has been improved already, you know? Okay, so you think what would you that's eventually going to be the manner by which people exchange currencies? Like instead of going to an exchange mm -hmm. when you're going to visit Japan, for example, and trading your dollars mm -hmm. per yen, do you think Bitcoin or some version of the blockchain is going to be how people do that in the future? I do. Yeah, I think it's something that uh, governments are going to adopt. And I'm someone who I'm not I'm not one of those who say like, cool, decentralization, like that's the future and that's everything. I think it's all about balance at the end of the day. It's about central a harmony between central and decentral. And I always compare it to the body. You know, I have central energy right in my body. We always say stay centered, be balanced right from a spiritual standpoint. You have these energy centers, you know, called chakras. If you you know, uh, if you entertain those sorts of ideas. Uh, and then you also have uh, cells in your body, which are like little local individual entities that have all kind of bound together to form a single body, a more perfect union, as you will. Uh, so there's some, you know, um, I think there's going to be a relationship between essential and decentral. I don't think one's better than the other. I think it's about balance. And when it's only one, when it's only central or when it's only decentralized, I think we just run into challenges. So I think it's about harmony at the end of the day and diversity, just like it is in genetic diversity in our bodies, just like it is in investments. We look at portfolio diversity to, you know, to minimize our risk. And the same thing is going to come out here. The idea I think that support is to have multiple options for me to exchange value with one of you. Uh, it, and so rather than just having one option, which is a federal reserve note. So to have that ability, I think it's going to create and to naturally distribute a lot more wealth to more people, make things flow. And the and the money world is all about liquidity, about flow, the flow of currents, the flow of energy from one position right. to another with as much grace as possible, which Merseille in commerce, right, which is to exchange property, means grace. How do how do people who don't know anything about Bitcoin how do they figure out what to invest in and what, well, I don't want to go too much further because I want to talk about a lot of your other stuff, but real, just in a brief. Ask me what I've invested in and then don't do that. Like I have some <laughs> daily loonies, stay the hell away. They ain't going yeah. up. Just, just, just do these opposite of Kevin. That's yeah. It. So one, <laughs> yeah. So one thing is just to not focus so much on hype, but focus on just researching and understand that these are emerging technologies that are, penetrating 
virtual, virtually every aspect of economies and how, uh, how corporations and governments are governed, the governance protocol. So to do research and then when you feel confident and you're ready to make an investment to, to decision to invest. And I think the common thing that most people feel is like, did I get in at the right time? And that kind of is like, you know, my opinion and my experience is more of like a beginner term or question to ask, because usually one of the base strategies that we're all quite familiar with, whether we know it or not, is dollar cost averaging. When you're for your retirement accounts and things like that, you're investing a certain amount of money every week or, or a couple of weeks or a month over time. And so you're going to get in at a lot of different price points over time. You're not going to get in at one price point. So the most, one of the most risky things that you could do is just put all the money in that you're like, okay, I want to put in 10 grand in Bitcoin, boom, all at once. That's going to expose you to that one price point. And if it's under that, you're at a loss. If it's over that, then, you know, then you're at a gain. So, but if you realize it as something that you're investing in the future, that this isn't, it's not a fad that's going to last three months, six months, a year, it's going to actually be adopted and you can see a vision for that. Then uh, get in the habit of just putting maybe a little bit of money in uh and frequent you know every so often and then also consider adding it to your different portfolios that you have that you're saving for whether it be retirement or for uh buying a house a down payment on a house or whatever uh consider allocating a portion of your portfolio to a cryptocurrency great great i'm going to introduce you to uh leonard at some point uh because he is a producer and he's into to uh, cryptocurrency so uh, he's happens to be at the house today. So, okay. Um, but let's talk about your, uh, your companies. Let's talk about your, uh, I, the film, let's talk about the film that you're working on that kind of. So, yeah. How, so how I, are you helping people create their films? How are you helping? You've got a platform. Sure. So I've got a platform that, um, I founded with my brother about three and a half years ago. Both my brother and I are writers. And we recognize the, you know, the lack of tools that exist for people to create and produce and connect, even though there's lots of resources out there like social media platforms, there's crowdfunding platforms, uh, there's marketing tools. It's just a lot for independent creators or just creators in general to di digest. So what I would like to do as a primary goal is to help alleviate the entrepreneurial burden that creators face when trying to create a book, a comic book, a TV show, a podcast, a music album, film, TV, any type of digital media, augmented reality, virtual reality, which I think is where a lot of things were, were going. Um, so that was where, you know, the need for a, a production and entertainment ecosystem to come into play. And with that, I uh, am looking at blockchain technology as something to implement for voting protocols, for um, smart contracts, for revenue distribution, automated revenue distribution, um, and for IP accounting. So when you creators upload assets, that that asset, there's an account of that asset on the blockchain, just like you would be publishing something in the county recorder's office, it's on the blockchain, anybody could audit it, and that will help them in the future for copyright you know, protection and, and records of basically creating a creative work. So it's like That's updated it. everywhere in real time for everyone, as opposed to being held in a central location. The official record, is that sort of how you describe it? So it's interesting. It, it wouldn't be um, the way I'm understanding it now. So the blockchain is not used. It's a type of database. And so it's not used to 100% take over all data that comes in and stored in a website. It's more used as like an accounting resource to say who's got access to this and that, like to, like almost like permissions or something like that. So um, so that's the idea. And there's, there's two different ang worlds here, right? There's like the Netflix type world, which we have the media that's there for the consumer. But in, in, on our platform, it's where you would go look and you would say like, oh, I want to check out some new, you know, for me, sci-fi movie, movies or films or shorts or whatever that are out, maybe looking for funding, let's see what, what they're at. I could do a search for that. I can go visit different pages. They're going to have their uh, a page that has the reel or trailer of their story. It's going to have the creators who, who are involved in it, their fundraising goal, how much money they funded. And I could choose to be a contributor that I contribute monthly. And maybe I get access to some content by contributing and it gets add, added to my library. Maybe I don't. Maybe I become an affiliate marketer 
And when I share that, the reel on my own site and other people come visit my page and I get more people, I can produce revenue by recruiting more people. Because think at the end of the day, who are the biggest marketers that exist? It's fans. And so fans aren't really getting compensated for the value that they're providing and creators are happy to provide it. They would love more discovery. It's one of the most challenging things we as creators face. How do we, you know, how do we get discovered by more people who are interested in our content? So to have a platform that kind of takes that into consideration, that takes the revenue element into consideration, that takes team building into consideration and making it to where if I work with this person and I do concept art for them and I license this artwork to them, that you know that you're getting a share of the revenue that comes in because it's it's regulated through a smart contract. And so it's not up to the other person whether I get paid or not. If that if that image or creative work, whatever it is, is licensed to the project, then I'm gonna get um, you know, I'm gonna get revenue. It could be very small, but uh, or nothing. But it sounds like it's heightening its transparency and its accessibility. It's definitely heightening transparency and accessibility for people to come together. And it's kind of taking what people like me would do in the LA space, go out, meet a bunch of people, connect with them, work to trade with them for a while, maybe try to find some way to give them value so they can contribute to your project or try to build your project up so until it becomes sustainable. So uh, the platform is help, is meant to help make that happen and also to help to reward fans for sharing the, the things that they're attracted to. And then the experience mode, kind of like a Kindle interface where you could experience the story, you'll be able to get access to, like imagine if you're watching a movie and then you want to talk about this scene or something, what platform do you go to? There's Reddit, there's other platforms. Why isn't it right in your interface? Why isn't it just right there, the discussions about the scene right there? So that's just, that's just a little glimpse of there's so much that could be done. I could click at a, at a touch of a button. I could click the funding, where the funding of the project is, or if they're looking for job, if they're hiring, I could find that also. So there's so much that can be done or that's surrounded around a production. It's a job, job creating, it's entertainment, it provides so much value. So, and for me, I plan on releasing my sci-fi fantasy series on it. So- Can uh, we talk about that? Can we talk about your series? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's hear about it. I want to. I want to hear about this. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'm it's start, it. I'm so kidding. I'm um, I'm 38 now, and when I was 19 years old is when I decided that I wanted to be a writer. That that was like my calling. I want to build worlds. I want to create the clothing and the language. I have full control. Let's say, and if I don't like something about it, I can change it. I remember that being my attitude. And so slowly, uh, being a, a lifeguard in Las Vegas at the Las Vegas Hilton, I had a lot of time sitting on the lifeguard stand and then uh, been open during the winter time. And I would just think about ideas of characters and stuff like that. And I came up with a general storyline. I knew it was gonna be science fiction. I knew it was going to be about planets and, the, and that planets had a higher functionality and that there was you know, galactic communities and ancient civilizations and things like that. And then, over time, kind of characters started, you know, coming to my mind. And I wrote the first book when I was, um, and I'll go into what it's about in a second, but I wrote the first book when I was in my early 20s, went to Comic-Con with the South by Southwest. I wanted to release the first book as like a magazine with like artists that I featured. So if I wrote about a meal in the story that like I would have a cook come and 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 uh, make the meal based on the, the description in the story, then I'd feature that that uh, cook in the story as a character. So my ideas were always based on what you said in the intro, which is that I'm really into taking imagination to reality. And I'm also looking at like Disney and things like that and Disneyland and having physical places you could go to, to experience, to become characters in the story. We wanna become characters in a story. It's like, there's no way that movies are like the highest form of storytelling. I think they're like a stage of evolution. I love and appreciate movies and I plan to make them, but I feel like it's bigger than that. But hmm. back that's really interesting to me. I like that a lot because one th one thing we've all learned is is the uh uh video games are making more money than the movies right now. You know, so interactive kind of kind of experiences and kind of uh, uh with the uh uh virtual reality and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I think that's all going to come into play. I think you're right. It's going to involve, it's going to evolve into something much bigger than anything we've ever seen, and I think it's going to happen fairly soon. How do you feel yeah, about I that? Do. Yeah, I do too. I think augmented reality and virtual reality will end up taking over, and I'm sure there's a lot of different perspectives on this, but mine is that the digital world is a dimension of reality. 
We have the spiritual world we can imagine seeing, smelling, tasting, listening, and touching. We can imagine all of those things. We can experience them with the physical body. So I would say that we have the physical world, we have the spiritual world or we, in our imagination. We have this world in between that's coming out. It's not going away. You could throw a pandemic at it. It's just going to grow bigger. Uh, yeah. So the digital space is to me a, a another reality and it is every bit as part of nature as everything else is. And I know we as humans love to feel that we are separate from nature. What we do is separate from nature because it looks different. But I, I get that perspective and I think there's a truth in that, but I also think there's a truth that everything is nature. You know, I wasn't gonna go in this direction when I started interviewing you, but I wanna talk about this a little bit because I've, I'm very interested in your thoughts on this. Um, one of the things uh, that, that people are talking about, especially Elon Musk and people, especially Elon Musk, let's be honest. Uh, he's talking about incorporating um, microchips and uh, to, to save memory and to improve memory and to improve body, body all kinds of things to improve uh, body function. Mm -hmm. And it's basically becoming, uh, bringing technology into the body. And, and um, I know a lot of, one of the things I'm, I'm honestly concerned about is hacking. Once you start bringing technology into the body, people can hack your body. You know, um, I know I'm being simplistic about it, but it's it's just something to be concerned about. When when you have that access from your bi biology to the internet without even a computer or anything like that, that's I think that's a concern of a lot of people. How do you feel about all that? So what I think is it's a perfect drama, which is is great for the world. And that is there's this great authentic conflict that arises with this. There's like benefits, there's concerns. Are we gonna lose our humanity? Uh, or are we just being more of what humans are? Um, and then can we trust it? And the thing, one of the big terms coming out in the blockchain space is trustlessness, where you don't have to trust anybody. But the challenge with that is there is some type of governance that is happening with these entities. And this is why I think, you know, going back to cryptocurrency, which, you know, which I think will come for full circle, is that, um, is that there's the kind of, we have all of these different governance experiments that are going on. I know cryptocurrency is a big term, but really good. there's a lot of governance going on. Bitcoin has its governance, Ethereum has its governance. There's Polkadot coming out, which it's very complex and in-depth governance structure. And, you know, there's projects out there that have, uh, you know, like EOS, which is one of my favorite projects, but one of the big focuses on that was governance. And then I think governance went in a direction and it gave so much decentralized freedom that it basically ended up going in a direction that I think they didn't want it to go for a while. And so, um, so I think it's really important for us to hash out this, this, uh, these sets of Petri dishes of all these different governance experiments and economic experiments to see what, which, what gets tried and tested to maybe build a little bit more trust into the trustless nature of the crypto space. Uh, but I would be both open, I would be open to contact lenses for sure, augmented reality <laughs> contact lenses, getting recharged by your pulse and your eye. I can see that as, as happening. You're, you'll end up carrying your phone on you as your hard drive where everything connects to and it's always probably going to be something removable, removable because think of implant, I think too permanent for lots of people. It's just like, you know, any other, any political argument. Well, which it's, is not, it's, not, it's not all going to be removable. Like Elon Musk is talking about putting chips in the brain to improve yeah. memory and stuff like that. Yeah, it um, probably wouldn't be. I would let a, a, at least a, a, quite a few people test something like that over a period of time, I think, before I was interested in something like that. Oh, no, no, no. Um, but I'm, look, yeah. I'm looking far into the future. Do you think, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, right now is where we're at. We know that it's going to be a long way off. I mean, not that long, though. I mean, it's there's there's nanobots and stuff that people, you know, people think it's not real, but it's real. I think but, we um, might. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think we might bypass that at some point. I think it's gonna to turn to a point to where, cause I think the body as it already exists has so much potential and we're only accessing just a small amount of it. And so I think that uh, over time that 
Um, we're going to learn more about biotech, about how our bodies work, about frequency and vibration. And we're going to realize that, you know, in my opinion, when we build these mechanical things, they are representations of things that already exist in nature. We're kind of making like artwork or representations of it to kind of better understand it. And we could use them and it's all in the name of art and creativity. But I do think the body has so much potential. I also think there's a multi-life process going on here. That's just my own personal philosophy that there's multiple versions of the body where we keep this persona. And to me, if you ask me why, I would say, because it's a better story. Uh, it's, it's really about the storytelling at the end of the day. I think it's said in the movie Life of Pi that the whole movie Life of Pi uh, has a whole perspective on the power of storytelling. Yeah, yeah. You think that that sort of technology is going to be controlling or do you think it's going to be more of a conscious programming of your su subconscious to sort of put you in the zone? I can see both. That's a good question. I could see both happening. I see also just, yeah, of course, like you were talking way in the future, like imagine, okay, people are resistant to it. Years go by, a decade goes by, two decades go by. What happens then? Uh, I mean, the younger people are yeah. going to be used to it. So it's going to be more exciting. It's going to happen, you know? Yeah. And, but it's like, but, and then it's like, where does biotech meet? It's like, really, it's biotech meets just what we would call regular tech that we could presume to be like this lifeless thing. Um, I can see it happening more on a biotech level, I guess you could say. I think it will start with just pure tech in itself, but I think it will become more like like organisms and, you know, um, what do you, uh, sim what symbiosis. What do you do? What do you do to keep, to, to, bring your brain function up and your, your focus, because you are, you're one of the clearest individuals I've ever had the privilege to like, you know, speak to, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to you, you're, 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 I feel like I'm, t I feel like you took the limitless pill from the movie limit limitless. <laughs> I mean, seriously, how, how do you, what do you do? It's so great that you say that because the quote that I'm going to give you now to start off with the answer has the word limit in it. Uh, and that is the limits of my language or the limits of my world. And I really love that. And I am a dictionary studier. I'm a etymology studier. And I really uh, have got, been obsessed with the way that words relate to other wor wor words and how language works. I can actually recite the legal definition of the word word right now. Uh, wow. And it's, it's, it's quite sophisticated. And so I can tell you the legal definition of the letter A. Uh, doesn't mean I know everything, but it's, it's, you know, cause there's so much to learn, but I would say definitely, um, that language vocabulary is really important in helping to communicate and, um, and, uh, and, and not just having a broad vocabulary to understand the, an in-depth understanding of the way that words are related to an, uh, one another. That's I amazing. Think, I think all artists are like as a comedian, you know, angry is funnier in one joke, but livid is funnier in another joke. And the reasons for that and what makes a word work in a certain yeah. situation and not mm -hmm. in another situation is going to be true of writers, songwriters, uh, comedians, basically any kind of artist already has a little bit of that. And it seems like you have a very deep dive into that sort of thing, which is fascinating. And there, okay. there's I'm supposed to ask you about the word dingus. <laughs> I've heard it before. <laughs> I, I've definitely heard it before, but I wouldn't, I'd have to go to the etymology to see because oftentimes also definitions are surprising. Oh, um, we, we, we yeah. stumped you. Oh my God. We I think you. it's a group of dingoes describing themselves. <laughs> yeah. It also could be like a family. Don't families have like us at the end from like a biological. I don't know, but I think I'm going to start going with having a dingus. Yeah. <laughs> only one of me, Danny. There's only one of me. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, the funny thing is, is as much as I'm into language is that there will often come up words that are very common words that I've heard. I know I've heard that word a bunch of times. It happens all the time where I'm like, I don't even know what that word means. I got to go look it up. And that's actually one of the things when I was getting into law and studying the law dictionary was that I was just became hyper curious. Like what's the definition of the letter A? What does the word thesaurus mean? in the law dictionary, you know, like, or what does the word, like, I think it is in Black's Law fourth edition, the word treasury, 
or no, the word thesaurus means treasury. So just okay. digest that for a second, that the legal definition of the word thesaurus means treasury. Huh. Or it might be the reverse. I might have it backwards. It might be treasury means the source. Either way, it's st it's still as stunning. Um, but it what? basically is going to tell you, showing to tell you that from a legal standpoint, the limits of your language are the limits of your world. Uh, I love it. Okay, we got to get on to the next guest in a second. But uh, dingus apparently means something that doesn't need to be named. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> there you go. We just wasted a minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it means thing. It's a it thing. Means thing. Okay. My well, kid got okay. kicked off of Xbox for calling somebody a dingus, but literally all it means is thing. So thing. Oh, interesting. What you call it? <laughs> it's a Dutch word. Interesting. All right. So anyway. where can people find you? So um, I've got two websites. One is StarscriptLegends.com, and that is uh, the place that that's the location for the social crowdfunding app now. Um, I do have a, I'm pre-marketing for a crowdfunding campaign on there. So we're raising money to crowd, we're crowdfunding to raise money for our crowdfunding platform, of course. Uh, but right now we're in active testing. So if you become a crowdfund contributor on the site, don't bother making account, an account on that site because it's the, has the old prototype, uh, platform on it. Uh, once you contribute to the crowdfunding campaign, if you contribute on the highest tier, at least that's where we're testing right now. So high tier contributors, which are called world builders, they're pre alpha testers. Then the middle tier is the explorers, and then the lower tier is the stargazers, and it goes pre-alpha, alpha, beta tester. So you basically become an earlier tester the, the more money you contribute. Once you contribute, we'll send you a link. Uh, if you're right now, like I said, we're in the world builder stage, but if you're if you're doing it at that stage or whenever we enter the stage that you contribute to, we will send you uh, a link to where you can create an account on the actual uh, test platform, which will become the main platform. So we are testing right now. And then my other site is orderofmerchants.com. And that's the site that I do business development through. I do web development. I do business planning. Um, I do crypto consulting, uh, marketing, uh, sort of like a founder for hire. And then I do have YouTube channels for both sites also that have videos that have been recently published in the last month. Fantastic. Fantastic. We have definitely got to have you back on because you're just such a wealth of information and such a cool human being. And I'm, I'm glad I met you and thanks for coming on and hang out because you're going to come back for ask Anthony at the end. Awesome. Yeah. So those of you who are watching, check out the uh, link on the bottom of the page, uh, uh, anchor.fm slash the Danny McDermott show slash support, uh, connect with us, tell your friends and promote and let's, let's keep, keep this show going because it's, we're finishing up our second season, our finale next week, and we want to really start digging in soon and, and bringing it out, getting getting this out to more people. Because I, I really believe that the people on this show we have have been amazing, and I think I think they deserve to be heard and seen. And that way I can hire a new assistant instead of Kevin. So thank you, guys. And uh, <laughs> uh, Listen, where do I contribute? How, how can I put that on layaway? And own a little piece of Kevin, that. half your head is gone. What are you trying to do? I, I have know. been moving my light every single second of this show. That's all okay. I've been doing. I've become obsessed with it. Buy another light, Kevin. I totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Zach, hang out in the green room. We're going to bring you back later. Thank I'm gonna, you. I'm going to hang out and watch Deepak. Beautiful. 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 Great guest. All right. So Interesting guy. Oh, he's amazing. He's I'm amazing. I'm looking forward to I was literally sitting at the party just expecting small talk and all of a sudden, whoosh, just all this information. And I sat there, I was just like, wow. You know, I, <laughs> I like all of our guests and genuinely they're entertaining. I, I sort of have maybe a special place for the ones that teach us a little bit too. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. It, it's, it's sort of like infotainment. <laughs> it is. It really is. Which I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Then you got to learn something, Kevin. <laughs> I have a little thing, Danny. Can't you tell? <laughs> you just like to hear the information. You don't like to remember it. <laughs> yeah, because then it's a new lesson. You can, you can just tell me again. <laughs> <laughs> repetition, repetition. Okay. So I'm very, very excited about this next guest. Um, I'm so excited. I don't even know if we're going to do the segment this week because uh, this guy is so talented. He's currently the lead singer and violinist for the pop rock electric electronic group robot nature. I know every guy in that band 
and they're good people. Very talented. He's also currently orchestrating and producing new musical content for the highly acclaimed Disney animated series, Mira, Royal Detective. And there's a lot more. Please welcome Deepak, the other Deepak. Hey, hey, hey. What is up, bro? How you doing, brother man? I'm so glad you have you on the show, and I'm so glad to hear the echoing. I love it. I have it ready just in case you wanted music first, and then I can always Let's turn do it the off. Music. Let's do a song. Yeah, you know, I was gonna I was gonna play you guys a song just to start it off. The song's called Like I'm a Robot. I'm gonna do an acoustic version of it from the band Robot Nature. <laughs> Decided that I was in love again. You call my name, and I hear you say, Hey, come over, and I and I say, Yes, like I'm a robot. I've been trying to hide it There's no way now I can fight it Oh, but I know that I don't trust myself Like I'm a robot like I'm a robot Cause when I'm next to you I feel like I'm a robot I am so amazed yeah, By your fashion Oh, and you don't even have to try Oh, Oh, it seems so easy for you Oh, to start a dream just for two For two But I know that I don't trust myself Like I'm a robot like I'm a robot Cause when I'm next to you I feel like I'm a robot Like I'm a robot Like I'm a robot Like I'm a robot Some help with my heart. Yeah, and I just need some help with my heart. Ooh, and so I start a dream or two. 
And so I start to dream of you like I'm a robot. Awesome. Awesome. That was Dude, great. You are so talented, brother. Thank you, my man. I am Good to always be here. amazed. Always amazed. Good um, to be here. Thank you for doing this. You're our first musical guest on the show, man. Really? Yeah. Well, first one to do music on the show. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, happy to happy to be that then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we had Jesse on, your drummer. And by uh, nature, represent Jesse. He, yeah, he badmouthed you the whole time, man. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> As I would expect, and I will do the same. <laughs> so dude i love dude what, one of the things i love about you is your style like dude i mean i you know whenever i go to see someone perform someone's band perform i'm always i'm always like uh eh, are they gonna be good is is the sound i one of the things i hate is when i can't hear the lyrics to the song mm. you know what i mean how 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 do you guys get that kind of perfection in your performances in your live performances I mean, where you can hear the lyrics and everything out there. Well, yeah, where you, I mean, it's dude. You, when when I see you perform live, it's like listening to the album. Some people think you're better live than the album. Yeah, I think part of it is just really the arrangement of the music and making sure ahead of time, regardless of what venue we go in, that the actual music caters to each part. So you know, you could have sometimes too many layers going on, regardless. And those layers will take over each other and it sounds like a little bit muddy or the lyrics get buried or something like that. So I think if you even focus on arranging the music in such a way strategically that it creates a vessel of all the sound and that the vocal can now sit inside that vessel and then the whole thing comes out like a Death Star, like kind of focusing like from Star Wars and then shooting out like a laser of energy. <laughs> That's kind of how I like to envision like a live show is we're all on stage, a bunch of different lasers, like the Death Star kind of zooming into one super laser and then shooting that positive magic energy out to all of you. And then and uh, even more having the audience be a mirror where we get to receive that back and it creates sort of a, a Tesla free energy spiral of like, co-creative energy experience like i certainly feel energized when i see the crowd dancing and smiling that moves me that makes me play better that makes me sing better that makes me com connect more to even the words and the energy and the notes and i think everyone on stage feels that like richie on keys i see him i look back and we feed off each other i look at the i look at jesse i look at richie you know i look around and i'm like dang that feels good we're like you know a unit and you look at the audience and now i'm just i love just being uh, you know being the position i'm in because i'm kind of in the middle you know, like I look at myself as more in the middle, you know, I got the band here and I got the audience here and I get to, I get to, I'm lucky to get to soak up the energy from both sides. You know, it's a really fun experience. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing, dude. I mean, I love, uh, I mean, I love you guys as people, but I also love your music and I, I've shown it to people and hopefully we'll have it, some of it in my movies coming up, but, yeah. um, how did you, how did you come up with the name Robot Nature? So I was sitting um, in Big Sur, if you guys know that's on the west coast of California, one of the most beautiful parts of the coastline. And I was just sitting there meditating, you know, at one point and thinking about music. I've been, you know, doing music for a minute, been had my own other projects before Breath of Life Tribe also, which is like kind of a spiritual rock uh, fusion jam band that toured the world for years in the in the conscious scene, the yoga community a lot of touring. It felt really good. I had a band called The Bolt before that, which was like a rock band. We were doing this, this whole major record deal thing. And I feel like something had shifted in my career where I had been sort of looking for the next uh, thing to express to the world. And Robot Nature just started forming because I'm really into sci-fi. I grew up in a sci-fi. And we were talking to Zach earlier. I mean, Zach's like, you know, one of my best friends, partners in crime. I'm a part of Starscript. He's a part of Robot Nature. We're sort of one unit. So it's kind of cool that you got to meet at his party and I had no idea we were going to be on the show together. That's a complete, I just, I worked out timing. You didn't know that? <laughs> well, I found out when, you know, I found out at some point, I think, I think he might've mentioned it to me. I was like, Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know that. That was all. I knew you guys were talking and have now become friends. And I know that you and I have been friends for years. And then suddenly I knew he was going to do your show. And then you invited me. I didn't realize it was all at the same time. Cause I was just, you know, scattered doing a lot of things. Right. And that's interesting because, you know, I'm involved heavily in crypto and blockchain and he and I have been working together on that as well for years. And so I'm oh, actually wow. I actually teach cryptocurrency all over the place on Clubhouse and lots of different places like that. 
And so, you know, back to the robot nature, you know, sci-fi has been a big part of my background. I grew up obsessed with Arthur Clarke, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, 2010, 2061, 3000, you know, Rendezvous with Rama, all of his books, Isaac Asimov, and all of that, and always kind of viewed the world through through sci-fi and through tech. And so sitting on the shores, or sorry, in the on the hills, on the ledge of Big Sur over a cliff, just meditating at night, seeing the stars, suddenly I had this whole vision of a future story beyond the music of, of and I don't want to give away too much of the story because I'm working on it as we speak. And that's actually the bigger project is the actual TV series, like a full level robot nature entertainment universe with a TV series, feature films, anime, uh, manga, comics, sideshows, all the kind of same kind of model of the Marvel Universe and the, Rob and the uh, Star Wars Universe. But within robot nature, there's an entire story that takes place 800 years in the future from now. And that That's story amazing. started. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that story started downloading into my head. And as it happened, little by little, I started hearing songs starting to come together that were separate. And I started going, wait a second, that could be a good song or sound that could fit this robot nature. And I ended up sort of you know, continually developing the story over the last five, six years, um, but really focused because music has been something I have access to more quickly. You know, I'm getting to learn more about, right? I'm looking to partner with writers and things like that, but that's not my not necessarily first strength. I see the vision in my head. I see the whole story, but I can quickly write a song. So I just ended up gravitating towards what came easier, which was the music and wrote a lot of songs that became Robot Nature as a band first. And now I'm actually, as we speak, as of the last couple of months, really, I've been writing the story behind the scenes and having conversations about it and recording myself and my voice notes because I'm more of a, an auditory learner and listener and, and, and writer. I write through talking. Um, so I've been doing that for years and just developing a really thick development of the story. And there's a lot of artwork now that's formed due to collaborations with Zach, actually, with Starscript and some of our artists that are part of the Starscript team, Owen and Rita, who have done all of the Robot Nature musical cover art. So it's all one big family. And uh, so that's kind of where Robot Nature started was with that. And then it was me solo doing what you heard just now, that lo live looping solo stuff. And then over time, the band formed um, when our manager, Sydney put uh, a band called End of Ever together that had lost their lead singer with me solo. And we ended up forming the band Robot Nature as well. So there's sort of different aspects and chapters of Robot Nature. Uh, a big part of it's the story, though, that's going to be coming together in, in visual form in, in the next couple of years. Well, I'm I am 100 percent sure you guys are going to succeed because you guys are clearly talented, amazing performers. And you I love the, the whole thing about manifesting and and creating your own world. And you guys are doing it. You, you're doing it on a big level. Nobody realizes it yet, but you guys are about to. You know, and once you get there, you guys love your work, you love what you do, and you're going to just create magic like you always do, man. I love that about you. Thank you, man. I love I'm just giving you a replacement for Kevin. No, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, to me, magic is really comes down to a simple thing it's being a child, being a baby, being in that curiosity at all times. That's where magic comes from. I think when you're born. As a baby, you're born with infinite possibility. There's not a limitation yet. So you're in the state of curiosity. You're in the state of discovery. You're in the state of questions. And I think if we remember that in our adult life, that brings us back to the curiosity of a child, we can have the best of both worlds. We can have the maturity and the focus and direction and navigation of an adult while maintaining a, a beginner's mind, a childlike spirit, and a youthfulness that gives us energy to create not being caught up in the limitations that we were, you know, that we grew up you know, throughout our lives hearing, you can't do this, you can't do that. I think to me, a big part of growing up is growing down and unlearning all the things that have held us back so that we can still believe in flying and magic and that of a child. And that's, that to me is hopefully embodied in this music is magic and, and, uh, and curiosity. No, I love it, man. It's, awesome. it's so true. I, over the years, I've had to unlearn so much negative programming you know what I mean? We and all I do. Find, I mean, that's part of being human. It's, I it's got it. You're not born that way. There's What's no that? such thing as a two-year-old who's going to look at you and be like, this walking shit just isn't going to happen. I got to crawl forever. <laughs> right? I mean, like a kid's just like, I can do anything. You know, like yep. a kid's thinking about things. That there's imagination. I think we have that too. I mean, you know, I think so, at some point, some of us might lose some of that. And I think 
that would be something I'm motivated to as like a purpose. Like what's my purpose uh, as a human? My purpose is to hopefully inspire and reinvigorate imagination, childlikeness, the, the idea of limits and just kind of be an in infinite possibility awareness, which is a part of a big part of my brand is the phrase infinite possibility awareness and being in that as much as possible. Anytime we take on anything new, whether it be food or anything, if we walk into something and we look at it and now we're prejudging it before trying it, then we've already created a filter on how we're going to receive it. And at that point, right. that's going to jade. That's going to actually shift how it's received by the senses, all six senses. Well, and on we a actually, microscopic yeah. level, Mike, yeah. this, is, this is true. We studied, I studied, I got my engineering degree. We studied this on a microscopic level. The minute something's observed, it changes. Exactly. So, and it's, so it's, if, right. And so if we can continually over and over again, just keep going back to zero state, the zero yeah. state awareness, then we can constantly be in that new every time. I can watch a movie sometimes. I watch sometimes the same movie over and over again, and it almost feels like uh, I've never seen it before. It's like the first time. I don't remember a lot of things. I, and, and in a way, it's a good thing. It comes back. And sure, it's in there somewhere. But I decided to not think about it too much and then make all this meaning around it. I decided to just kind of just let myself go like a roller coaster, go on the ride. And when the ride's over, like, I don't remember the, what, every detail of the curves. I just remember feeling good. And it's more about the feeling yeah. than the specifics. And then I can just hopefully put that into art. It's just constantly just leaving people with the feeling. People remember what, how they felt when they meet you, not the, not the specifics, but they remember the emotion. And if you can mm. capture yeah. that and if you can convey that, I think that's how you can expand your horizons and your network of humans by just creating good feelings everywhere. That's great. Well, now you were talking about when you observe something, you you try not to judge it and you try not to totally remember everything. But as a screenwriter, when I write scripts, I watch a movie. I want to see every little tiny detail, how they did it. Uh, I was watching uh, Tootsie. Uh, I, I was showing my friend Kaylor the movie. She had never seen it and we were watching it. That was Barbara Streisand? No, no, that was uh, Dustin Hoffman. Oh, Dustin Hoffman, right, Tootsie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was a moment where he's dressed as the woman. That's he's right. dressed as Dorothy. He's at, the, the love of his life is next to him, and he's he's looking, and he's dressed as Dorothy, and he's staring at her, and the beautiful music, it's, -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da, you know, and it's beautiful. And then it pans over, and you see her father staring at Dustin Hoffman like, with the same love on his face that he was, it's a beautiful like pan and reveal. So, so how do you, I mean, I mean, you, you must look at that kind of thing too, when you're studying music and art and stuff like that, because you learn from that, right? Yeah. It's a dance. It's a delicate dance between uh, being in the producer mindset versus the receiver. And so you can kind of go into both. Like I watch a movie sometimes, you know, I've been on sets before. I've been an actor. I've done, I've been on all parts of the film world too, as a music person. And also, you know, from, from the days of shooting for modern family, you know, as a co-star on that show, things like that, you know, I remember what it's like, but then, you know, I can, I guess I can go into watching mode and, and being in the mode of like, oh, that's the set right there. And that's all that. And that can happen. Right. But there's also, I just want to make sure that I still have the ability to completely let go of that and just go on a ride. And as long as both are there, then I feel good. And luckily, luckily they're both still there. Like, cause I, I would, I wouldn't hate to not to be able to, I would hate to be listening to music and always be in the, oh, here's that layer. Here's that thing. Right. And I know a lot of right. musician friends of mine are like that. They're like really, they're also some of the best musicians I know. But they're right. also not able to just sometimes just tune out and just like go for a ride. And I love I, I'm holding on to that because I'd rather not lose that. I'd rather right. always be able to be on the ride. It makes it easier for me when I bring a movie that I love to someone like I was living through her eyes, watching her laughing. I was enjoying the movie through her eyes. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. That's what's fun about sharing something you've seen with someone that's never seen it before then you get to experience their joy or if it's a comedy, yeah. their laughter, or if it's like, uh, you know, uh, we're going to talk later on the show about series that we've been watching, but you know, I've got the experience of just now, like having, uh, you know, the person I love got to watch a show that I loved from back in the day and I got to rewatch it again. And honestly, I didn't remember any of it at all anyway, because I, I would, I don't remember anyway, but it was perfect to be able to not only experience it again for the first time myself, but then to share that with someone who really had never seen it. And that's, that's, that's part of the joy. Yeah, and it makes you feel like you're watching it for the first time again, too, which is kind of cool. 
full on. So the combination of it already be, already being slightly on the spectrum where things are always for the first time for me anyway, slash watching it with someone else, that's a, that's a win-win for me. Yeah, yeah, it is. It really is. Um, so how did you, how young did you start playing music? How did, when did you get into, because I mean, you're so talented, dude. You do, you do so many, um, so you play so many instruments. Your, 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 your voice is incredible. I mean, that was one of the things I, I just, I saw you do a solo. I'm trying to think of what it was, but you had a, uh, it was a video where you, you had the, uh, What's the thing that make you, you sing into it and then it repeats that while you sing something else into it? The thing I was using earlier, the looper pedal. Yeah. What's that called again? It's called a looper pedal. It kind of goes like this. <laughs> kind of like that. I love it. Do, that. do a little of that. Show the audience okay. something. This is cool. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. McDermott show. Wow. <laughs> okay, we want that for the new for the new show. For there the new go. season. We need a new song. We you got, you got it right there. Dude, totally. I love it. I love it. So how how so that's young the, so that's you? the looper pedal? So how the question, how young? I started music probably uh before I was born, just because my parents were very musical. My mom was an amazing singer, uh classical singer. My dad played Vina. I was a very musical family. Uh, but also very spiritual family, very deep in the ancient Sanskrit lineage, as well as scientists and computer science and math. So I grew up with a very rich array of, of different parts of the brain. And so when I first started playing an instrument or singing, it was probably the age of four, four or five-ish. And then violin came, I was singing first, dancing, copying Michael Jackson moves and mimicking things and hearing jingles on TV and kind of singing them back. That was sort of a lot of my, my uh, musical background was just hearing and mimicking things around me um and then and being sort of a little bit not normal socially in ways where the structure that they attempted didn't work and so i was kind of always did my own thing just studying and learning from the things around me i got really obsessed with bands that i heard about when i was young like nirvana and radiohead and picked up the guitar by ear and taught myself just by listening to them and teaching myself how to play guitar i was obsessed with video games like final fantasy and lots of games like final fantasy had an amazing soundtrack and so I taught myself piano. My friend, my neighbor had a piano, and I would just try to play the Final Fantasy music on the piano. So that was sort of my background in music was TV and video games and just listening to Michael Jackson and copying and teaching myself basically how to do what I was hearing um, for years. And then getting into uh, Deepak Capella, which is my name, Deepak, but acapella, and just layering my own voice like you just heard on top of myself. Um, trying to do songs that I loved, like the Beach Boys and things like that. And eventually, I started writing my own songs when I was probably about 11 on the guitar and just kind of getting into summer camp and having emotions while in summer camp and thinking about songwriting and stuff like that. So that's kind of like the background of music. But I didn't know I was going to be a musician. I went to school. You know, I did. I was a tennis player, a violinist, math person. I was a mathematician and did pre-med and pre-law, graduated with neurobiology, neurobiology, physiology, studied criminology, criminal justice. Then I did finance, got licensed in series six and 63, all that was working on series seven in the finance and mutual funds, but then ended up, ended up quitting all that suddenly. And cause something in my body was like, yo, you need to, you need to tap into that artistic side that you experienced during college. Like during college, I was in acapella groups, touring, doing that whole, like the pitch perfect movies. Like that was actually my life. Though that pitch perfect movie is literally not an exaggeration. We were running around, like a frat and a sorority, like singing a cappella and going to parties and touring. And that rush of performing during college, I remember that as I was graduating, I was like, oh, that's what I want to do later. You know, I was still kind of not on the path of that. I didn't think that was a reality because I'm coming from this like traditional Indian background of science and everyone's going to be either an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or, or computer sciences. And so I didn't really know there was other options. I didn't realize that. But some friends of mine had moved to L.A. from college that were in the theater department and started acting and started telling me about this whole world in L.A. And you can go on set and you get all this free food and catering. I was like, well, that's not really fun. <laughs> I was like, there's craft service. I was like, amazing. Let me go to L.A. So I quit everything and came here with my instruments and started uh, 
pursuing music and kind of really quickly fell into the music industry. You know, it was pretty fast. It was within a couple of weeks. I was already in like record labels doing stuff, you know? Well, you know what I love about, uh, first of all, I just want to know, are you from Krypton? Because, uh, <laughs> no, I'm from, I'm, a, I'm from the future and from a place called the Robosphere, which you'll know about soon if you can live long enough, or maybe future generations <laughs> will know of me as I've now come back to be here in this time. Awesome. Is there, is there a big influence that you have that hasn't been introduced to this world yet? From the, fu from the future? <laughs> yes. I can't leak it yet, but I, what I'll do is not say it, but I'll do it through everything that I'm conveying. That's the influence that you're hearing is that oh, future. No, Kevin, if we tell if we tell the person they're famous now when they're not famous, you may just destroy the whole timeline. The whole matrix. And, okay. and then well, you, you yeah, know what they say in art. They always say show, don't tell. It's in songwriting. <laughs> it's in art. So I'm not going to tell, but I will happily show. And is there a watch. particular artist that when you encountered them really ex you you talk about your you know like awakening is there an artist that kind of stands out to you that awakened that hey this is something i want to do or some level that i want to reach yeah straight up i would say if it kind of got to narrow down to michael jackson and radiohead those would be two major uh influences in terms of going whoa like that's Kind of, and then later on, so many more. I mean, there's a million influences I have, like off the board. But if I think of like pivotal moments of like when I was a kid, you know, thinking about Michael Jackson and being like, you know, just like, wow, that's something I could do. And then later on, listening to the album OK Computer by Radiohead and going, wow, that's not such a beautiful piece of work right there. I'd love to make work like that, like a rock opera sort of fusion, uh -huh. psychedelic kind of like ballad, ballad odyssey of like futurism and amazing lyrics. You know, those are kind of things that move me. But then it goes on and on, obviously, Pink Floyd and you name it. I thought I, saw, you know? I thought I saw Marvin Gaye and Prince. Yeah, I mean, I am I love Marvin Gaye. It's interesting that he's been coming up lately. I'm a fan. Uh, I, I wouldn't I, call I thought I, saw, I thought I saw George Carlin, but maybe I'm wrong. But I wouldn't say Marvin Gaye would be an influence. That's just someone I respect. Prince came later, uh, and I looked into Prince later. and was like, oh, this is totally up my alley with multiple instruments and dancing and some of the energy of it. Mm -hmm. I think people more told me that they felt Prince, and then I went to find Prince after because people were telling me that. The um, people of, in yeah. the whole world, I definitely totally. see that. Definitely. Yeah, I think I think I think I just naturally kind of had this energy and then people were like, hey, you remind me of Prince. And so then I looked and researched him later and then fell in love with him after. Well, you live the, the one of the things I can't stand when I'm watching these uh, competition shows, I see these singers singing the songs. They'll be singing a sad song, smiling and shaking people's hands. You know what I mean? It's like they don't live the song. And one of the, one of the things I love about you is that you live the art whatever art form you're doing you're 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 living it you're feeling it you're it's coming out as there's no it's like when you're an actor and you're on stage if you're good enough you can forget that you're not that character and i feel like that's what you do you become uh the artist well that's a, that's a huge compliment i mean i appreciate that i mean i feel like Again, that comes back to what we talked about of just being a child and not even thinking about all that stuff. To be honest, I'm just like, all right, what do we gotta do? It's time to play. Oh, you don't play. You don't work music. You play music. That's a, there's a there's a reason they use the word play instead of work when describing what you do as a musician. So I'm here to play. I'm here as a human to play, whether it's music or not. I'm here on this earth to play, and hopefully that can come through. I mean, I'm spending probably half my week talking, or if not more, about blockchain and cryptocurrency and to me that's the same thing i'm just having a good time playing it's like a song to me cryptocurrency and blockchain i, and I gotta get your mindset dude because some things i'm like no you know <laughs> but i gotta yes. get your mindset i gotta get your mindset because it, i'm not I'm, I'm becoming more open again um you know and i'm at a point where i feel like yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I, honestly, the, the whole beautiful thing about the mind is that it can instantly be a shit. It's not, it's not like you have to like, you know, you can actually just make a choice in one moment and all of a sudden everything is different the next moment, I literally. Know. You can do yeah. it instantly. You can just be like, all right, now I'm going to believe in everything. And then all of a sudden now as you go through life and you start seeing yourself not, you go, oh, wait a second. I, I just changed my mind the other day. I believe in everything. Let, let me now reprogram that new thought. And you can just do that over and over again. And it's not that I love that. Yeah. I got to spend more time hanging out with you, buddy. All right. Now, listen, I will, before we go into another song, let's talk about your sunglass collection. Okay. You want to see them? Yes. <laughs> right here. I got a rack. I 
of lots of different sunglasses. It's tough to it's hear, tough hear you. Hear you. I can't hear you. That's because the mic was on. I say right here, I have a rack of just lots of different sunglasses, and some of them light up. There's lasers. Now um, I'm seeing Elton John. There's lasers. There's all sorts of stuff. And I will say, you know, I've been collecting different sunglasses for years, but then as of recently, my lady, my my life partner, Jennifer Estebans, really helped increase a lot of the, in general, like, you know, she's tapped into a lot of the vision that I have for fashion, which, you know, I described and she just tapped into it and helped me find all sorts of new clothes and things that kind of fit what I'm going for, you know, so I've been collecting, you know, I've had all kinds of different cool outfits for years, silver, and now I just have a rack of new ones and this sunglass rack and, you know, I really kind of feel like I get to express myself in the way that I want to, you know. Now, how many different types of sunglasses do you wear a day? I probably go through about three or four in a day, depending on what I'm up to. You know, it's a, it just changes throughout the day. Like I do interviews a lot. Uh, I do live performances. Sometimes I go to the grocery store and I'll put on, uh, you know, I'll put on these. <laughs> I love it. Put them on. Let me see. Yeah. Hold on. Give me one second. <laughs> Kevin, you should be more like him. <laughs> Do you Where's the player, Kevin? Look at that. These it. are kind of dope. I also have uh, I have a lot of different hats too, not with me here, but I have like silver hats, shiny hats. I have hats that light up with late. I have outfits that have LEDs embedded into the outfits. That's so, so cool, man. That's, that's so cool. All right. Starting to come together. I love, your, I love your improv. Can you do I mean, but you did you plan a song or what what did you Yeah, I got a, I got a, I got a nice I wanted to play a song more of a ballad that I feel like cuz you guys are in the film world. As am I, and I feel like this song really has a cinematic feel to it called Just My Heart Again. Let me put on the sunglasses for that. We'll go for that song. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, these kind of, these kind of, this has a little spinny thing. Can't hear you. This thing has a cool little spinny thing. Like oh, there. look at that. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of dope. dope. All right, let's see. I'm going to be at a bit of a side angle, but that's okay. How's that right there? That looks good. That's it? No. Floating in and out of daydreams I hear your voice, it's whispering And you say, why does love hit me like a landslide Never giving me a chance Chance to hide myself or get away. Maybe we're all fallen angels. Yeah, we're learning how to sing again. And you see, we live these lives a broken majesty, collecting tragedies. Cause it's all we know But it's all for show And you say It's just my heart again Don't let it bother you It does these crazy things It does these crazy things It's just my heart again 
It's just my heart again now Shooting at the moon Mixing memories with dreams You know I need some help to find my way So start by knocking down these walls inside of me And I'll still fire from the gods for you Break the chains Cause it's come to this It's time for you and me to be free It's just my heart again Don't let it bother you It does these crazy things It does these crazy things It's just my heart again it's just my heart again now Shooting at the moon Mixing memories with dreams And singing all by myself Now don't ever try to tell me wrong Don't ever try to tell me wrong And singing all and don't ask why don't ever try to steal my song Don't ever try to steal my song It's just my heart again Don't let it bother you It does these crazy things yeah. It does these crazy things It's just my heart again It's just my heart again now Shooting at the moon Mixing memories with dreams ah, ah. Wow. Now, I, I I have to ask, and I couldn't ask this question to somebody who isn't multi-talented. Do you find any particular instrument influences you? Like, is the violin something that you couldn't do a sad song with? Or is there any particular instrument that you find exerts an influence on you? I mean, I think each one does. I wouldn't say it's a limiting influence. I think each song and each moment has a different feel because now it's not just the instrument. Let's just put it this way. If I'm in a moment where I'm feeling something, that feeling is a feeling. Now, if I take that and I approach any instrument, each instrument will channel that in its own different way completely than another one. So I might write a, I might take that exact same feeling and write a different song if I start with the piano than I would if I start with the guitar or start with the violin, but each one is still gonna convey that same thing in its own way. Or I might start with the vocal or I might start with producing a beat. Um, so in that way, yes, they each do it, but it's still reflecting where I, where, where I am in that moment, if that makes sense. So um, going along those lines, how, how do you, like I was trying to learn the guitar a little bit but when you're learning the guitar, uh, how do you get that passion when you just can't get your fingers to do the things you want them to do? You know what I mean? It's like, I want to learn to play like you, but it's like, I'm sitting there and like, after like a half hour of my fingers tripping over the chords and like er, over the uh, strings, I'm just like frustrated. How do you, how do you get through that? Yeah. I think what's helped me from the beginning has always been, just making sure I keep it fun, making sure I'm doing something that I love to do while doing it. Like, you know, I look back now and now there are, there were times where I was told to do scales and do all these scales and I didn't do them then. And I'm actually starting to do them now, but I'm approaching it with love. Um, but I think what helped was, you know, like, okay, this is a song that I love so much, like this Nirvana song and maybe, you know, picking a song that was within reason 
uh, of difficulty, for example, so that I didn't get too, it wasn't so difficult that I gave up. But, you know, Nirvana songs are really pretty easy songs. You kind of learn that. It feels good. You get like a little micro win because you can learn it more quickly. And then that kind of boosts a little nitro boost, you know, to the next thing, to the next thing. So I think part of it is like, you know, if, if there's like a hard song that's a goal, maybe have that on the list, but let's not that be a hindrance to learning. Let's also pick a couple easy ones along the way so you can feel good, uh, you, so you can feel those wins. And, you know, if there's something psychological about having little micro wins leading towards bigger wins, I think that applies to anything, whether it's business or music. And so having that, I think, is important. That's smart. Yeah, that's no, you're right. I mean, there are plenty of three chord songs that I could just play for fun. Yeah, wow. and that's what all people do. You start with the couple. You start with also the easiest chords, even like some chords are harder. Like the bar chord takes a lot of people years. That's a that's a chord that makes people want to quit. So you know, maybe start out with an E major, E minor chord that's only two fingers or three fingers, and yeah, aren't, it isn't too much of a stretch for the hand. And then you can feel good, like oh look at me, I'm already playing something. And now you right. feel good that you're playing something. And then you like, add a little bit something harder, you know, you know, and if you're like super motivated, yeah, go for the gold. Like I have, I've had some people that have asked me to help them with music over the years and they just go right to the goal. They're like, teach me stairway to heaven, which is like one of the hardest songs to learn. And I'm like, Hey, if you're as long, if you're motivated, let's do it. And some of them have been motivated and it's taken maybe a year or two to learn it, for example, but you know, because they were just in, in the mindset was already there, but there's other people that want to learn. I just say what we just said now, do whatever, depending on where you're at, as long as you can feel like you're having micro wins along the way, then that's going to work. And if, it, if that includes a bigger song, cool. But it, sometimes that might just mean do a couple easy ones to start. That's awesome. So where can people find you? Um, lots of ways. Uh, I'd say right now the best place to find me is on Instagram under the real Deepak, spelled D-P-A-K. Um, and that's like probably the best because that's sort of like a central hub. Now you can find robot nature from there. That's like the first thing you see in my bio was a link to the robot nature Instagram. Um, and then another easy thing people can do is go on Google and just type in literally the other Deepak spelled D E E P A K. <laughs> if you look that up, you'll find stuff for days. You'll find my IMDB. You'll find old stuff from old projects. That's kind of an old identity of mine. Um, it's not the current one at all. The real Deepak is my real identity, but the other Deepak is still around and it's an easy way to find me if you're new. Um, and hopefully that'll also lead to the new stuff I'm doing, which is more on brand with the sci-fi stuff. Because I was doing a lot of other stuff. I've also been involved in health and wellness. I do cooking. I'm a, I'm into veganism and I have a recipe book. So I'm involved with a lot of different things in life. So the other Deepak is more like the spiritual uh, health and wellness guy who was involved in the yoga scene and stuff. And there was a lot of music around that guy. And now this guy, the real Deepak, spelled D-P-A-K, is more the future robot guy who also happens to be the lead singer of Robot Nature as well. That's amazing. So you're more than one person. I can't even be one. There's a bunch. <laughs> There's more than that. There's India Jackson, which is like the funk you know, guy, you know, funk uh R&B Michael Jackson guy, which That's name awesome. which, which Zach, by the way, who we'll be seeing in a second, who was just on the show. He's come up with a lot of my cool names. He came up with India Jackson with me. So, you know, got to well, give credit where credit's due. Let's get my boy on here. We should be on here at the same time. This is That's the magic. You know what's crazy? We didn't even get into hey, yeah. composing for Disney. It's crazy. It's all on the, in, on the interweb, you know? Yeah. So if you guys want to find out more about either of these guys – uh, the information is going to be in the links after the show. Again, please remember, we need your support uh, so that we can get more than five people watching. <laughs> We've got uh, anchor.fm slash the Danny McDermott show slash support. Uh, no spaces. So uh, make sure you do that. Sign up. Become a regular person uh, that watches the show. I guarantee you you're going to love it because we're just getting amazing. As you can see, we're getting incredible people on the show. And and uh, yeah, soon we will get rid of Kevin. I'm kidding. I love Kevin. This is a Kevin. I hired Kevin just because of that. So I could rip on him. So thank you, Kevin, for that. <laughs> anyway, so we've got the segment now that you've all been waiting for. Our friend and yours, please welcome. Let's do it. What are you streaming? What's up, bud? I can't hear you. You got to unmute I'm yourself. <laughs> Every time when I mute it, I'm like, yeah, I'll unmute it on cue. You watch me. 
and every time I don't. Hello. <laughs> How are you, everybody? Good to see you. What's up, buddy? What's up? Um, killer interview, hey. gentlemen. Killer interview. Yeah, I'm having a good time. I was like, oh, keep going, keep going. I'll just hang back. No, they're um, coming back on. Both of them are going to come back on the show for sure. Badass, badass. Um, all right, so we're going to mix it up. Uh, usually I do you know, movie reviews from yesteryear or just some, some shit that I'm into. So I figured, you know, let's kind of go more into the future. Let's do streaming and let's kind of mix it up and see what everybody else is streaming as well. So without further ado, and this is probably one of my shortest segments of all time in space, which kind of jingles Danny's balls. Okay. He's very <laughs> excited about this. Okay? The fact that I guess for three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably going to be about a two-hour segment. I, I'm totally lying. But <laughs> without further ado. Uh, I need another drink then. Hold on. <laughs> he's not kidding. He's not kidding. Uh, Castle Rock. Uh, some of these are a little dated, but this is about a year old. But uh, I don't know if anybody's heard or has seen this. It's on Hulu, as you can see. Uh, it's exactly what you think it is. It's basically an intertwined fictional uh, story, uh, 10 episode story arcs of Stephen King's uh, fictional characters in, in the town. So basically, you're getting Annie Wilkes from Misery. You're getting Salem's Lot intertwining. Okay, so oh, it's wow. pretty. Yeah, at first I was like, all right, how are they going to pull this off? And I was like, wow. After I I banged out one of the seasons, I was like, Stephen King is totally proud. Obviously, he's an executive producer, but in terms of writing, these are his characters in, in his town, but it's not his his screenplays. His, his TV scripts. So the writing is so fucking good. And I got to tell you, we actually fucked up. Uh, we threw it on and we're watching it and totally into it. And as we're finishing it, we're like, oh, fuck, we started on season two. Uh. <laughs> so we got we to gotta jump back to season one. But season one is its own, you know, story arc. So yeah. uh, unfortunately, um, it may have been canceled. I'm not sure if this is season three, but I can't, I can't uh, uh, commend season two enough i'm sure season one's fantastic because they at least had a season two however it's so fucking good anybody i've never seen it but i'm going to now oh it's no, badass dude yeah if you're into like like you know deep I'm writing and thriller and horror it's like this is it and the acting is phenomenal so i've read so many of stephen king's books man killer the next one uh, we're gonna go to netflix it's gonna be the pharmacist anybody 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 this is a, a kind of a true crime documentary this one's fucked up. Very well done. And uh, basically, by the way, Danny, I'm drinking truly. So I should be muting the uh, microphone when I burp because it's basically <laughs> seltzer booze. <laughs> seltzer booze. <laughs> seltzer booze. They should just call it that. Seltzer booze. <laughs> Moving forward. Uh, <laughs> they should call it drunk burp. <laughs> or that works too. Uh, as long as the microphone is muted. Uh, but yeah, the pharmacist is a, a hell of a piece of work. And at first I was like, All right, I'll give it a shot. Basically, it's a middle class family in New Orleans. And uh, the dad's a pharmacist, as you can imagine. And his son, uh, early, early or early 20s or late teens, uh, has a drug addiction. And he, he was none the wiser. And he actually actually gets killed uh, trying to pick up some dope. And his dad, you know, the cops weren't fucking helping out whatsoever. I mean, they're, it, unfortunately, in, in the Ninth Ward area of where they were living or around where they were kind of living, uh, there's so many murders that it's just their, their, their work is so fucking piled up. So the dad takes it upon himself to try to track down his son's killer, and he actually finds him. OK, uh, that said, he still has a hole in his heart. OK, and uh, being a pharmacist, he wants to see what he can do because he's still like, you know, grieving his child. And so is his wife the loss of his child. Long story short, he realizes there's a, uh, being a pharmacist, an Oxycontin pill mill in the area. And there are, there's an epidemic of people dying. So he starts like surveying this pill mill, like taking video coverage, right? Uh, it gets to the point where he gets the FBI involved. He gets all these other you know agents involved. He takes on big pharma. It's like, holy shit, this guy is, he, he records everything, he uh, audio, so on and so forth. So check out The Pharmacist. Uh, it's amazing what this guy achieved. One human being achieved grieving the loss of his, his child. So I'll leave it at that. Check it wow. out on Netflix. Yes. it's. I think it's like uh, eight episodes maybe. Um, 
By the All way, right. Zach, Zach and Deepak, feel free to chime in whenever you want, guys. Well, that's perfect timing. I was actually going to uh, take it upon myself to say, hey, who's got uh, any other streaming uh, things in their lives? What's going on? What are you guys watching? What do you got, guys? Deepak? Yeah, I mean, um, well, the stuff I'm streaming currently is stuff I've already seen before, but I'm re-watching it uh, with my lady who's never seen it before. So we just went through classic old school, you know, Breaking Bad and then Better Call Saul. Just, you know, I've seen them now several times straight through. Better Call Saul is incredible. Um, well, so I'm wondering where the next season is where, you know, I'm waiting for it. You know, it's really good prequel. It's incredibly made. Um, just, you know, I'm big into Disney of course, and uh, as we talked about from the interview, I work with Disney as well, but in the sci-fi. So I've been loving all the Star Wars related and also Marvel related shows. Been streaming those on Disney Plus as well. So a lot of good stuff going on right now in Streamland. What about you, yeah. Zach boy? So I caught Loki today, which just came out on Disney Plus. I think today was the first episode. Um, so I watched that and it's definitely got a really fun theme and it's building into this whole multiverse world that Marvel is, uh, clearly going into. Um, so that's one thing that I just watched today. And then the last season I just finished was the expanse, um, mm -hmm. which is something I need to watch. Uh, probably it's got some good repeat value, I feel. And there's a lot of really great graphics in it, I think. And I understand that it's, you know, a lot of CG and stuff, but still I think there's some awesome graphics in there uh, and just really great ideas about space and ancient history and what can be done on a more cosmic level after we've graduated from just being on a single planet. And the last one that I have to mention actually is Raised by Wolves. And if, if uh, you're a sci-fi person, I think it's Ridley Scott and it's a show they've been through, I think it's just one season now. Wow, that, is an interesting one. I'd recommend it. Badass. Yeah, I actually saw uh, season one Expanse uh, after years mm -hmm. of my friends saying, dude, watch it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, you were right. I should have watched that years ago. Uh, it, yeah, it's super cool. Uh, killer. Um, have you guys heard of a show called Banshee? Yes, I, I have not seen it. I believe it. Is that the is it the, the uh, Desperate Housewives guy, Mark Cherry? I have no idea. I just was told to watch it when I finished. Me the too. Someone said, watch it. That might have been, we might have been together on the boat, actually. That that day. Or <laughs> that's possible, actually. We, we were on a boat together. Yeah, that's that's when I, we were Deepak. told about it. I wanted to ask you, Deepak, if you have a favorite character from the Breaking Bad Better Call Saul universe. Oh, man. I would say Gus, you know, and also Mike. You know, the two of them, I just, I just love. I mean, oh man, each character is amazing. But you know, uh, I love, I love me some, I love me some Bob Odenkirk, of course. Like Saul himself is like he's incredible. What a, what a character. He's. Awesome. I really, I really gravitate towards Mike a lot. Just his whole persona. He's so stoic and yet focused, and yet he's just got the love. He loves his granddaughter. He's got a purpose. He's always doing things for that greater purpose. What and what and maintaining integrity in the world of you know of crime that he's in. You know, like he doesn't want to have unnecessarily death unnecessary death he doesn't want to he wants to protect the innocence he's got like a high level of integrity while doing what he does and to me mike's very respectable as well as gus and you know, the two of them together when they start forming that partnership during better call saul it's like it's like a historical feeling because you you know it's already established in, in breaking bad you see it developing it's a really really beautiful to watch how yeah. about lalo lalo is while he's like kind of a gritty guy he's also got a happiness to him yeah, Lalo's awesome. That's a that's a that's a energy filled character. What are you streaming, Kevin? I thought he said steaming, so I was gonna say vegetables. <laughs> no, I tend to stream like I what my favorite thing to stream is 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 like baseball. If I see that there's a no hitter in the sixth inning, I jump on and I I stream the rest of the game. You know, if somebody's going to set a record, whether it's a hitting streak or anything else. I try to catch it, and I just love the the actual this moment dynamic of streaming a potentially historical sports moment in real time. And baseball is probably the best game for that because it's constant and it's the most quantified sport that we have. You talk about you talking about like uh, statistics. Yeah, like you know, if if somebody's going for their three thousandth hit. Or especially pitching, you know, I don't know that we'll ever see a 300 game winner again unless they, unless they make three innings makes you eligible for a win. 
you know. So uh, some of those events, they, they're just to me uh, the ability to witness it while it happens. To me, is the the most powerful element of streaming for me. Didn't we go to? We went to a couple of Yankee games together with our kids, didn't we? We did. Yeah, that was we some did. good times, man. Fun. I think we were at a game where Derek Jeter set a record. Did Am he? I. I I'm, oh yeah, I think you're right. I think. I, and we were also in a game. It wasn't, it wasn't the number of singles or the number of hits. No. It was something else. No, it was something else. And I think we were at a game where they uh, celebrated Rich Gossage. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So sports. Well, well right now, I mean, NBA finals are going. I've been watching. I've been, I haven't missed any of those. I mean, Clip, the Lakers are out. Clippers still in. I've been. That's been epic. I've been loving the NBA finals this season. It's been. It has. Luca, Luca's been off the charts. Luca's like, tearing it up. Luca's just out of blowing my mind. And 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 Kawhi, you know, two yeah, games down, two games. There's some really good players happening. I've, I've watched all. I've watched all those games like the last couple couple weeks. Or two, Me too. A lot of people have established themselves at another level, like uh, Booker, like Aiton. A lot of guys are are, I think, could build on this postseason to enter that superstar realm. It is. There's some. There's some. Some rec and talking about records. There's some record breaking games happening. Record breaking stats. You know, triple doubles happening left and right. I mean, it's incredible. Luca and Trey Young got traded for each other, and both of them really. Established themselves as superstars, I think, this postseason. Hundred percent. I take Luca over over Trey. I'm not a fence sitter. Well, I've been streaming a couple things myself. Um, I had, you know, it's funny because I I stopped streaming for a while because I found that my whole life was streaming. <laughs> you know what I mean? Once you get into a show, it's like. It's like you ever been glad when a when a series ends so you can get on with your life? Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every time. It's true because I'm like I, this is so great but I'm really wasting my life right now. Um <laughs> but I I one of the things uh that I'm watching right now before I talk about the one I've mentioned before uh what's it called? Uh Ragnarok. Uh Yeah. It's dude, it's awesome. It's where this kid realizes he's the god Thor. And he's and there's other the, the giants and the, you know, it's all about how they're realizing that they're gods and how they, they thought they were normal people and how they get their powers and kind of stuff. It's very I I what country Deepak, what country is that shot in? Do you know? Not sure. Isn't it in Europe somewhere? Yeah, it's. I think it might uh, Ireland. No, it's not. But it's definitely UK. I think UK. Yeah, it's in, that's one of the one of those like Ireland or Scotland or something like that. Yeah, and it's you know nor what I like about it is they don't do the subtitles, they do the uh, they do they have actor Brit, English actors do the voices, but they let the actors do the acting, and it's uh, if they do it right and they get the voice right, it's really cool. It's a very unique. I didn't think I was gonna like it. But it's as long as they get the voice right, as long as you don't have a big Thor going, hey, I'm Thor, you know, then it's okay. You know what I mean? But uh, I love that. But the biggest one I've loved and I can't wait for the next season is Cobra Kai. Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. Dude, All Cobra, about Kai, Cobra Kai. We had, we had one of the actors from Cobra Kai on this show. And uh, I was just watching it again with a friend. And, uh, the cool thing, Craig, actually, I think we were watching it. Yeah. And um, we, I love how they cut back to the original movie and they keep the storyline from the original Karate Kid. And boy, oh boy, is the acting, especially from the adults, the kids, you know, I mean, they're kids. So the, their acting's pretty good, but the, the, I mean, it's just the acting from both. What's, uh, I hate to say it. I forget the, uh, the, Lead's name. The lead isn't really uh, the Karate Kid. The lead is the other guy that he beat. Uh, William Zabka, Billy Zabka. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. he is phenomenal, yeah. dude. He's like a. Oh, it's down a show. Out. It's a show. Oh my god. Yeah, he's yeah and Cobra Kai is getting a lot of love because we've done this. We gave it, gave him a shout out before, like seventeen episodes ago, 
and rightfully so. We, uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a cheesy fun piece of work. Well, it's so. but what's unique? What I like what's unique about it is that you know other series they'll have the person be an evil person and then suddenly switch just for a storyline, and it it it, it mm. doesn't even make sense how they switch. In it's this, common, actually. Yeah. In this, there's some predictability, of, like always, but his character is growing, and he had backpedals a little bit, but he's growing, and you see why he grows, and his acting is a testament to why that's working, I think, personally. I it's, think if he grows too much, amazing. it's going to kill the show. He shouldn't grow too much, in my opinion. He should grow some, but <laughs> if... You're going to lose all comedy if he grows too much, in, in, in my opinion. No, he's still going like, to, yeah. he, he still keeps his character quirks. Yeah. If it becomes like, you know, but, if he's yeah. starting to work at LaRusso Auto and he's just like, hello, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. Okay. So that's, my, that's what I'm streaming right I now. I want him out of step a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. Right. Yeah, Zach's who Zach's got, got me like sucked into it. Zach, you, you should talk about Cobra Kai. I mean, that's like, you got me into that real good. Yeah, I basically did the same thing to you that our mutual friends Laylee and Chad did to me, which is like when they saw it, they wouldn't stop talking about it. And I'd seen it like, you know, in Netflix and I was like, there's no way that they can do this. Like they're trying to do everything now. Yeah, right. And then they're like my two friends were like, we're listening to the soundtrack on their boat because I'm helping them, uh, you know, deck out their boat. And then I just went and watched it. And then it's like it's like what Danny was saying, but like the reverse, which is once you get into it, you're like, I actually need to stop my life right now and watch this show. <laughs> and enjoyable. whatever whatever was a priority before is not as much of a priority. I just need to watch this show in like two days. Yeah. Uh, and then I would not stop talking to Deepak about it until he finally watched it. And then he binged it also. I've seen I it three, three times. Not even a break. Yeah, I just already. Yeah. I'm, like I'm one, I think it was one day. Again. I think I watched it in one day. Yep. <laughs> There's well, uh, so, please, because syndication, when you watch that same show before we had all the streaming platforms, when you watch that same show at six o'clock every day or six and six thirty every day, you it just becomes part of your life. And when you binge it, it's 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 like a love bomb. Yeah, it's emergent. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah the, uh, gone are the days. Gone are the days where you have to. Well, gone are the days where you have to like. You watch an episode and you have to wait a week. I mean, you can let them stack. That's what I do on the on the <laughs> few episodic series, TV series that like are you know weekly. I let them stack. I'm like, yeah, I'll get to it when it's like you know done, and then just bang them out. I uh, sometimes, find yeah, they were able to do that. Say again, was that sorry? I sometimes find that that week of thinking about what just happened in 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 Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul is sort of like a, a therapeutic thing. Like, well. I need some time. It's a marinade. Yeah. The maybe, intensity right. is like I need to to ruminate on this. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah right. That's that's going to be a self control thing, then, Kevin, because you can still do that. <laughs> do I look like I have self control, Danny. I have no self control. Zero. Yeah. I'm, I I got to binge it. But yeah, that's what's cool about some of the Disney Plus, the Marvel shows that they've been able to yeah. pull that off, um, because they have such a huge network and such a huge ability to do that and hang, and still not lose their people. I think there's a balance between who can actually pull that off effectively these days and who can't. And there's no question that Disney can do it. If anyone can, you know, they're, they're, sure. they've got such a big way in their machine, their publicity arm. I've seen it now from working with them on the show that I'm on, like the way they do it is just bar none. Like no one can mess with it. So they were able to pull it off with uh, a bunch of shows recently that were done weekly. Um, but what's I up mean, with Loki now, is Loki uh, now weekly as well. Loki is Loki is on. It's now weekly. It's tying in. It's going to tie go. into um, Scarlet Witch and uh, uh, WandaVision, which is just such an amazing name because it's both their name, but it also me it has such a significant meaning for the whole uh, show. And then that is leading into I mean, we got Doctor Strange coming up uh, with Man. the Multiverse of Madness and. There's some Sp Spider-Man stuff happening, also linking in that space. So all this stuff is going to tie in. And the thing that I love about Marvel is back in the past, like a, a good streamed story or a story like in movie, like a successful story is like you got a trilogy out of it. And then after that, it's like pushing it, you know? Uh, right. Yeah, maybe you could do six. Maybe you could do nine or whatever. I mean, Marvel for that first round was, what, 23 movies? I mean, that's there's a new bar now. And that changed the game. Like that made everything else that looked like they were the, these big worlds. Like, oh, you're not that big. You've got work to do. You know. So yep. 
Yeah, yep. they got now each one's a huge feature film. Yeah, right? They got each one's a huge feature film. By itself is a standalone massive blockbuster hit. And then they got yep. 23 of them. And then they've got multiple TV series where each episode is like a blockbuster hit. I mean, they're they're really like setting the set in the bar on a whole new level. Yeah. The one thing I can't stand, though, is that everybody's got the different platforms. And so you literally, I guess it's good. It's really, ex it's good, except that it's all corporate. But it's good that, you have different platforms that compete with each other because that's going to create better work. But at the same time, it's like, man, how many platforms are there now and how many great shows you want to see? And you're like, ah, now I got to pay for Disney monthly. Brawny paper towels just released a streaming service. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. It's like crazy now. The market is fresh and ripe for the picking. Anyway, Anthony, what's up? Uh, shit's Creek, man. Shit's crazy. That show's sure. hilarious. Yeah. So uh, we got on this one a little bit late. Uh, we got on it after they started winning a bunch of Emmys. And it wasn't because they started winning a bunch of Emmys. It was because it kind of got our attention. And we love Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. Uh, and e Eugene Levy's kid, Dan Levy, is you know one of the writers and producers as well. Basically, uh, Levy and Catherine O'Hara, these are SCTV. You know, they've known each other for over 40 years. This oh, is the, yeah. That was the Canadian Saturday Night Live back in the day with John Candy and a bunch of other cats. Uh, so their chemistry is like just in terms of their acting chemistry. And uh, for anybody who hasn't all, seen it. All star cast for sure. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, um, I don't want to say every episode is fantastic. Chris Elliott is all, also involved. Oh, he's great. I don't want to say every episode is fantastic. Uh, like anything, especially comedy. Uh, it's like baseball to give Kevin a little analogy. Um, you, when, when they hit it, it's, it, it fucking works. When they hit a home fucking run, it's incredible. When they whiff, it's like, ah, oh, we'll get them next time, you know? And uh, this series is basically, it's almost an arrested development kind of thing a little bit. It, it, it gives me nods to that. But basically it's an affluent family that loses their money and they're living in a motel trying to make it work. And uh, they actually, uh, don't they? I think they own Shit's Creek. That's like yeah, they own the whole yeah. town. They ended yeah. up owning the whole town, and they end up like needing to go there later because of like a that's whole. That's all they got because of their yeah. whole tax thing that happened. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and Chris Elliott is the mayor. Of it. It. Sorry, they want to sell it, but nobody wants to buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're it's, stuck. It's, yeah, it's lot. great. There's a lot it's going, great. and then they end up living there, and this, and the people in the town are hilarious, and oh all God. the interactions. Yeah, and I, I think Dan Levy st steals a when he steals a show, he, he he fucking steals it. He's gone forever. Like, he's he a great actor. He's, uh, a he's great, hilarious. But I mean, even the, there was a there was a dramatic part where he found out something. He didn't even say any lines, but all the emotions that went through his face, and he just walks out. It was he stole the entire scene without saying a word. Because his well, acting is so yeah. I mean, I, I, I imagine having a uh, thespian like a, a Eugene Levy as a father couldn't hurt. Couldn't he's hurt. Better than you, you, he's better than Eugene Levy. He, Levy's good. Levy's they're fantastic. different. He's they're legend. different. They're different. Yeah. Well, his son, as far as they're dramatic different. acting though, his son is phenomenal. Phenomenal dramatic actor. Well, I love that. He's got a bright future in front of him. Uh, yep. But yeah, so that's what I'm watching. And, and to close it out. Uh, I'm rewatching Yellowstone because season four is coming out. Anybody? Anybody? Yellowstone and Yellowstone? Anybody? I, Anybody? I'm a big fan. I haven't seen it. I've heard of it. Check so. it out. I'm a big fan of Costner. I want to see it. I got to see so, it. So uh, just to back up, Shit's Creek's on Netflix for anybody. Uh, Yellowstone is on Paramount Network, but it's also on, I think, Peacock with commercials, I believe. I'm not oh, sure. my God. There's more platforms? <laughs> Yeah, I it's got, NBC, got Peacock. Peacock. Peacock, got Peacock or okay. Paramount. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just say this. So what we did is um, uh, Yellowstone came out in 2018, and it was like 20 bucks for the season. I'm like, I love Costner, and I, I, I like that he's, you know, kicking ass, doing what he, he loves to do, which is, you know, Western type shit. But wait, it's free. So I waited fucking almost two years. Like, damn, shit's still 20 bucks. Are you kidding me? I'm like, fuck it. So I bought it, and I said, if it sucks – I won't get season two. After we finished it, instantly bought season two. Instantly. Nice. Yeah. So basically, he owns like the largest piece of land in Montana. And everybody and their mom wants it. Okay. Everybody and their mom wants it. So he kind of runs the ranch. It's almost like if the mafia owned a horse ranch. And so the shit they do and the shit they're allowed to pull off, allowed to pull off. 
So it's like it's oil. And it's a, it's a dirty game they play, but it's also a dirty game that's coming their way. So it's almost equal. So check it out. Uh, I can't praise it enough. His daughter is fucking hardcore. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything beyond that. But it's it's just enjoyable piece of work by Costner and Company. Check it out. Uh, season four, I think, is going to hit later this summer. Uh, a friend of mine is actually, uh, he's got a big part in it. Lives in Montana. So we're all excited about that. But about awesome. beyond that, that's it, gentlemen. Oh, Susanna, jump in. I want to know what you're watching these days. Wait, oh, Susanna? You, oh, just, yes. you just said, oh, Susanna? All right. I 100% have to I did. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. Very funny joke. Very funny joke. All right. So today I am watching Dynasty. Da, da, I used to be addicted to all my children. But, you mean like you know. old school, like Dynasty, like Dallas, no, like that kind know, of vibe? Right? Oh, that's, like not some, that's not old school. That's like, it's a reboot. Yeah, it, it is. is. Yeah. There's a Especially new Dynasty? Yep. It is. And it's really good. Really wow. good. Wow. Um, it basically, so like All My Children is like 20 years of a soap opera, right? So this one is like every, every storyline in 20 years compressed down really quick episodes. So it's like kind of funny and campy if you're used to watching old soap operas. But it's basically about a family that was a grandfather. A father took over the company and now the daughter took over the company. And it's they're just building onto their family. And it's every ridiculous storyline you could ever come up with. And I'm only on season two. Yeah. Killer. Where is that streaming for people? This one is streaming on Netflix. Ooh, that's a that's 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 dangerous for me. When I finished <laughs> earlier this week was Dirty John with um, Amanda Peet and mm-hmm. Christian Slater. Oh, I love her. This one is the Betty Broderick story. It's about a couple who has been together for 16 years and she put him through school and he became a very successful lawyer. This is a true story. And he ends up cheating on her. And You'll have to read the story. It's very good. I wanted to watch it twice. Awesome. Was that good? Um, another one I've been waiting forever. Okay, so Dirty John you can find on Amazon Prime. Um, My favorite. Sorry, Prime. My one favorite. I've been waiting for a really long time to come back on because season one was so great. And season two just started. There's only two episodes out. Is Why Women Kill. <laughs> great show different storylines different women i'm seeing a theme here are they true stories um i'm not sure about this one but the dirty john, been, dirty john is true one story. of these stories so i'm interested <laughs> in the, the the why women kill and if they're true stories and if you have a favorite female murderer so lucy Liu is in season one and she ends up killing because He's dying of cancer. That's so she's not. mad. No, she's it, it's, it's a suicide. It's a help. Like she's right. helping him. Right. So there's different storylines, oh, different gotcha. things. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Netflix. Oh yeah, women. Why women? Or Amazon Prime. Prime. Yeah, yeah. Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus. Okay, cool. Paramount. Cool. Younger is on Paramount Plus as well. This is about a 42 year old woman who decides she gets divorced. All these women are like divorced. If you watch every single thing I've just showed you tonight, (laughs) I don't know why. Um, Anyway, so she's divorced. She has to go back in the working field and she ends up lying about her age, trying to be a millennial. And she ends up like tricking everybody because that's the only way she could get a job was to be young again. See, so it's not happy wife, happy life. It's if you're good with the cock, you get to keep the rock. (laughs) <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, it's in, all these encourage me to keep my skincare up. <laughs> wow, that's a car alarm going off in the background here. Sorry about that. Mute it if you have to. If you're not, no, yeah. steal the car. Fuck it. This is your chance. <laughs> this is your chance. Okay, so one, this one has a lot of seasons, and I really enjoyed this one. It's about a group of people that blow up the Capitol building and everybody in it dies except for this one guy, Kiefer Sutherland. 
course. And he is the designated survivor. And he was only, yeah, but he was only chosen the designated survivor because he, they felt he could be a puppet. So it's very interesting how it all turns out. How many seasons are there now? Because this has been around for a while. I think it's like seven. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's that's a cool plot uh, idea right there. No, there's only three. Three seasons. Three? Man, Three. Been, I, I think like I remember like 2015, 16 it came out. So all right, so they're not like rushing it. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Keeper Taking carries time. that. Yeah, yeah, Keeper has that reputation that just follows him where you're just like, yeah, 24. There's actually an actress yeah. in there. I don't remember her name, but she is the FBI agent and she actually like steals the entire show. Really? She is the only reason I watch the show. So Kiefer's really? mad. Yeah, let me he see. He was like mad. Awesome. So yeah. is there any like shut up in there, kind of like how he's in 24, you know? <laughs> he is very dominant. Very dominant. And so he's it's like well, not a hot. puppet. He is not a puppet. <laughs> no, he is not a puppet. And they are mad that he's not a puppet. Not at all. But he actually has to go through like everything our presidents have to go through with like terrorist attacks and yeah. all that good stuff. Reminds me, I recently watched Dave with Kevin Klein. What a gem of a film. Anybody, anybody love that film, right? Love it. Where- I actually wanted to say one more. Oh um, no, more. of course. I'm, I'm just, inter- and, I'm just chiming in and I don't have a graphic for it, but my favorite streaming show I think of all time is the good fight. And that's the knockoff of The Good Wife. It's like the spinoff with Christine Baranski. She is amazing. She um, is a lawyer, a white lawyer running a black law firm. And she microdoses on psilocybin. And oh. it becomes like a, a very political show if you're into politics. It's very polarizing. And... The very what what I found interesting about the show last season, this is like the weirdest thing, is last season was about memo six eighteen and how the one percent can throw this memo up and get out of any kind of criminal act or any kind of criminal issues that they have. It's called memo six eighteen. The very last episode of last season, they talked about Jeffrey Spoiler. Epstein. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They talked about Jeffrey Epstein and how they investigated his death and all that. Well, COVID happened. There were no episodes after that. And it's canceled now because of co- because well, of COVID. It, hold on, it's not canceled. I'm but C- CBS know. got sold like, to Paramount getting, after oh, that. Yeah, like we gotta do a buyout and cancel this show. That's the yeah, only way to get rid of this shit. Don't but, follow the crumbs, people. But actually, the new season comes out, I think, this week. So I'm and excited no to see it. No Jeffrey Epstein. No mention of anything about 618. Like, that's all gone. Yeah, but, it's been rebought and pa- repackaged. Yeah, it's it's like, yeah, we're gonna go, well, we're just all going to go to Disneyland now. It's yeah, fine. so I wonder all if it's right. going to be different. I also stream the Danny no McDermott accident. show every week. So should uh, you. Yeah, and dude. I think we should say goodnight. Killer. <laughs> nice yeah, to see you all. Good, show. good recommendations. You guys have been amazing. Thanks for having uh, us. What a great show. You guys are definitely invited back anytime. Uh, I, I, there's so much more. I, I, I Basically, I want to do a, a 24-hour podcast with you guys for like eight weeks because I'm learning so much from you guys. For charity, that sounds awesome. <laughs> All right, guys, check out the bottom. Uh, please support the show. Please tell your friends. Please uh, just promote and uh, you know help us out. And l- let's keep making some great shows with amazing guests. Thank you to my team. I love you all. Let's have a good night. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Peace out, everybody. Good times. Thanks. Nope. Uh.